Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Stewart. I work with the Immigrant Worker Project. Um, we're a community-based organization working out of Canton, Ohio, and six counties surrounding Canton, and also down by the Ohio River and, and other parts of central Ohio. This crisis that we're here to talk about didn't begin recently. Um, this has been building since 2009. And we've been seeing that in, in our centers um, throughout this whole period. We're currently um, working with over 500 um, of the um, unaccompanied youth that have come up from Central America, from the Triangle countries of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. As well as uh, right now, I think we've got almost 70 of the women that have been detained at the border that were released um, and have come to live in Central Ohio. So we've seen this crisis growing over time, and, it, and it's growing for several reasons. Um, one of the reasons that it's growing is the basically militarization um, of the gangs and the narco traffickers that exist in these countries, making these countries ungovernable states. This is not something that I say lightly. Um, this is something that um, the United States War College has said about several of these, these countries, that they've now become failed states and no longer are functioning states providing security for uh, their civilian populations. But to give you an example of what that means, um, one of the people that we're working with, um, we're actually working with his son now. He had been here previously, and I had met him um, when he was eight years old back in a, a small village outside of a city in, in, uh, in Guatemala, in Kenya. Um, and I met him when I, he, his father lent me a horse to, to ride from one aldea to the other. And at that time, that was something that you could do easily. He came here to work. He has many people from Guatemala working in the poultry industry. And after working here, he went back home to live his life with his family. He had no intention of coming back here. And he started a small business. Um, part of that small business was giving rides to people in buses from Canilla to El Quiche, which is the departmental capital. A week after he started this business, he already received his first death threats and the first claim that he had to pay 60,000 quetzales if he wanted to keep this business going. After that, it escalated. These are people that could tell him when and where his, his, his kids went to school, where they lived, when he got off of work. And when he would change cell phones, they found his cell, new cell phone number. He reported this to the local authorities. The local authorities say, well, nothing's happened. No one's been kidnapped. You're not dead. We're not going to investigate. Even though he knew if they came to his, his small aldea where he lives, which is a township outside of the, the municipality, it would take the police three to four hours to even get there. There are no police where he lives. And so his life was in grave danger. But not only that, they specifically targeted his eight-year-old son. And that's what forced him to cross the border and come here. It wasn't some desire to game the system or to get over it. It was the sheer threat of a violence against him and his family that was existing every day. I don't think we even can capture the enormity of the violence in people's daily lives. When we talk to the unaccompanied children that are arriving from Central America, and we start to talk to them about violence, and are they fearful, and what's happening in their lives, their first response is always the same. Well, no. Well, you stopped going to school. Why did you stop going to school? Oh, the gangs were outside my school, and they would beat me up when I would go to school. What do you mean they'd beat you up? You they'd push you around? No, they would take sticks, and they would beat me, and then they showed guns, and they said they'd shoot me if I didn't join the gangs. How often does this happen? Two, three, four times within a month. But you weren't afraid? Well, yeah, I was afraid, but that's what's happening to everybody. And it's that pervasive violence that is within these countries currently that's causing people to live. It's a pervasive violence that does not allow them to make a living, to have a business, to have daily life that feels secure and safe 
at home. And until we start to understand that crisis and what's going on, we're not going to start to take solutions to these problems that are just, moral, and that show the sense of morality that we should be showing towards the people that are coming, as opposed to opposing them, rejecting them, or jailing them in detention centers. Of course, you're in, you're in a jail, but it's not a jail, it's just a detention center. And so that's one of the, the problems. Those are the problems that are pervasive. And I give you two numbers that, that play a role in that, that shows directly how we play a role in that, those problems. The drug trade that fuels the gangs, MS, um, MS-13, Calle 18, or the smaller gangs in the little places like Roqueros or Rapteros, or the big narco traffickers like the Zetas, are all fueled by drug trafficking money that's t bringing in currently $40 billion to the Triangle countries and Mexico a year. Meanwhile, every day, here's the other statistic that I want you to think about. Every day, there is over 3,600 illegal guns moving across the U.S. border into Mexico and Central America. This is the fuel of this crisis. And we play a role in that fuel. And so you can't tackle this crisis without seeing the global influences and what's happening. 